welcome everybody to the first of our property series for 2021. And um, we're very excited to host our first property market outlook for the year. I'm equally pleased to welcome uh, our managing director, Sam Carlyle. Sam, good evening. Hi, David. Thanks and hi to everyone else. Thank you for joining us again. Yeah, wonderful. And then great to see you again, Sam. We, we really look forward to these. And I saying just prior to the broadcast that we've had such an impressive turnout and registrations for these sessions that it's just fantastic. I think everybody loves talking about property. So it's a, it's a great topic and we're very pleased to present um, the next in this series. So we'll kick off again. And again, for those people that may not have joined us before, we will just give a little bit of upfront uh, information here that this certainly is not to be taken as financial advice. It's financial education. It doesn't take into account your personal circumstance, but this is really about to help you inform you, inspire you, and just give you those tools in your toolkit to make good investment decisions. And we absolutely recommend that you have that expert team around you. We advocate that very strongly. That expert team, make sure you've got basically excellent legal representation. You have a great accountant. You've got a property strategist. You've got a great mortgage broker. We think that sort of expert team will really help you. Tonight, we are going to talk about a number of key research points. Um, and we just wanted to reference that we do use independent and market leading uh, research data um, from CoreLogic, Residex, even from the Australian government themselves. So you know, we base our, our information off fact. Um, and of course, you know, utilizing Sam's 20 plus, 25 plus years in the market. So we'll kick off as we do. We love a quote. This one's from the legendary Paul Clitheroe. Before you start trying to work out which direction the property market is headed, you should be aware that there are markets within markets. This quote absolutely really sings to us in terms of what we talk about with our clients every day, that there is no one Australian property market. There are many. There's more than 9,000 suburbs in Australia and we've got a dedicated in-house research team actively monitors the market and keeps on where those next growth areas are along with our research methodology which is something we're very proud of that we implement with all of our research and approach and that really leads us into getting stuck into tonight's content and I guess the first thing we wanted to do here is I'm sure many people have seen a lot in the media and I guess it's all about what's what's being spoken about so, so, uh, so much across newspapers, radios, internet. And Sam, it's a great place just to really kick off in terms of what you're seeing. Yeah, thanks, David. And look, can you believe it? We're nearly at the end of uh, the first quarter of the year and what an explosive start to 2021. And if you look at that first heading there, FOMO, fear of missing out returns to strain property market. Uh, and that certainly has been the case. I was talking to Sean Blackman earlier today, who's our director in charge of stock procurement. And he mentioned Stockland had released a 40 parcels of land over in Box Hill in Northwestern Sydney on the weekend, 40 blocks. They had 1,400 people attend. They had security guard. People were in tears that couldn't get it. And people are missing out. Um, land is scarce. And the home, building, home builder program uh, that the government put in last year has just brought so much demand forward. People that might've been living at home or renting or what have you have gone out and bought homes as well as other people looking to upgrade and what have you. So um, there, there has been record after record shattered at the high end of the market, the, the mid end of the market, the lower end of the market. And we're just seeing that Australia has just got this incredible momentum. And the question is, you know, I mean, I had people at the end of last year saying, you know, we're at the peak of the market. I'm going to wait for it to drop. I said to them, there is no way it's going to drop. Uh, if you wait, you will, you will miss out in some level or you will just be paying more. Um, you know, it's not sustainably going at this pace forever, but there is significant momentum uh, to keep driving the market up forward. And, you know, let's, let's have a bit of a recap first, David, of, you know, mm. what happened in 2020. You know, it's, it's amazing where we were doing this, uh, similar time last year and or just a little bit thereafter and it was when COVID had just come out you know it's sort of an anniversary of COVID and mm. it seemed like it was the end of the world a one in 100 year pandemic and um, interestingly the banks and economists were predicting 30 percent price drops um, as the year began to change and we saw some of the economics ec economic stimulus and measures put in by our government they shifted to you know you know um, more 
milder drops, then to neutral positions, then to predicted growth, now to asset bubbles. So what a shift. I mean, we've got to go from minus 30% to positive 30%. That's a 60% shift. So how did the banks get it so wrong? How, what, what caused them to shift that sentiment? You know, and if, if you look at back what we predicted, we actually predicted very early on that this was an opportunity and fortune favours the brave. And the clients that we spoke and engaged with to buy properties back then have actually really benefited of buying at the at the dip in the market and have made a great return. We're going to look at some of those case studies later. Um, so, you know, what have been the fundamental drivers of growth? And I think maybe just pop to that next slide, David, and that would sort of look at what has happened here. And, and um, just before we get to this overview today, let's look at, again, what happened in, in you know, 2020. And we really haven't had a financial crisis. Um, this is not a recession we've had. It was predominant, it could have been, but credit to our government and our leaders and the measures they put in place. They managed the health crisis very quickly, very well. There were some you know, errors and things that made, but fundamentally, if you benchmark us across the rest of the world, we've been exceptional and we're not a uh, totalitarian state. We will people into their houses. Um, but there has been a narrow financial crisis or a recession. So there was a technical recession for part of the year, but it's been a select number of people that have been probably really adversely affected. And that's, you know, maybe people in airlines or arts and performance. I, I met some people that ran a conference business. They've been wiped out. They, they are not going to survive. Um, so they're really, really affected. But yet everybody else, the, you know, the, the, the 90 plus percent of people that have maintained their job, they've actually been benefited. They, they, they've, they've actually been, uh, yeah, they've had a benefit because of COVID and the policies and measures put in place. As many businesses that have had record numbers, money is cheap, cheap, cheap. So once the fear uh, uh, was, was contained and dealt with, a sober analysis came in. And you know, there's this blunt economic stimulus by the federal government, which was just cash by way of JobKeeper, uh, the, the drop in, in interest rates to just, you know, not once in a generation low, but once in probably a federation low. Uh, and people were saving massive amounts of money. Secondly, you had... Um, People were locked in Australia. So tourism, uh, regional tourism began to explode. Um, and we, we've seen now that, you know, even the most recent stats is that employment is growing way up, uh, ahead of the projections. So uh, businesses, uh, you know, uh, sorry, yeah, businesses are advertising for more staff. They're busier than ever. There are new industries and employers looking for more staff. Employment is returning with a vengeance. The other thing that was probably really important to note here is that, the, the big fear at the beginning was, look, borders are shut. Uh, immigration's not going to come in. And Australia was generating about 200,000 new immigrants a year. And again, that has affected certain markets within markets, as we've said, and that is predominantly the unit markets within uh, Sydney CBD and Melbourne CBD. We've got the students and, and new migrants that come in. They usually position themselves in Melbourne and Sydney. So the vacancy rates, there are still hovering around the 5% mark in the Sydney CBD rental market whereas everywhere else it's down. One thing people didn't take into consideration was that the five, uh, there's, there's over a million expatriates or were over a million expatriates, a million Aussies, you know? So if Australia's population is, I don't know, it's about 27, 28 million at the moment, there's a million Australians living overseas. 500,000 of them in the last 12 months have come home. That is almost two and a half years worth of immigration that came home. And so if, if you hadn't accounted for those people, those people came back, they took up rental, they bought houses, they pushed people out of houses that may have already had. And, and that's why we're seeing rents now beginning to increase. That's why we're seeing prices go up and demand of people because we actually have more people with as, you know, not as much stock out there. So the, the, the areas that have been affected are those inner city areas, whereas the rest of the markets in your normal suburbia and even some of the regions we'll see have had massive growth as a result. And there's still a lot of Aussies wanting to come back. There's a number that are stranded as we've been seeing in the media. And then the other thing that's been just amazing as I've alluded to before is interest rates. People still need a return. People still wanna make money for retirement. Now that they've got the security of their job and their mortgage, they're paying a lot less. They got all this cash and that. It's not that hard to actually make a return. You can't, you'd have to be really, you'd have to try hard to not make money at the moment to really buy something that's not generating a great return. So even in property, you know, if, if you can generate a three and a half percent yield and you're borrowing money for three percent or below, you can actually make a positive cash flow. So the problem with that, though, is that, you know, 
people can take silly risks, overpay, and maybe not invest in things that will have sustained growth or returns, or it can camouflage the cost for them. And so that's where you need to be smart now because we've shifted from a fear environment to probably more of a greed one now. Um, and you know, the big question is, is the, is the market overheated? I still believe growth because fundamentally the, um, the Australian government, the Federal Reserve are there to stimulate the economy. They want us to get back to full employment and they're willing to, to allow uh, some asset appreciation to um, grow whilst we get people employment. Now, they're just not going to let it go um, without monitoring it because it is getting a little bit uh, out of control. So if we, if we, if we go back to 2019, the, the government through uh, APRA started sitting on the banks. We had the Royal Commission and things like uh, lending guidelines and it tightened up. And that, they're the instruments now you can start putting back into place where we start increasing LVRs. The RBNZ, the Royal Bank of New Zealand has done that. They're requiring people 30 or 40% deposits. They're making it harder for people to invest to go out and speculate the market because if you think Australia has been hot, some of the market in New Zealand has been even crazier. And uh, But again, as I say, that, that Australia's economy is in good shape. It'll continue to go ahead. And the momentum that's been put there by the the, the government will now be taken up by the private sector. And I'll, and I'll get to this thing about, you know, people wondering what's going to happen with jobs, JobKeeper finishing at the um, uh, end of this month, the Home Builder Program, what's going to happen there? And so, as I said, there's more expats wanting to come back. And we, we will also begin to see over the next two to three years, particularly with the vaccine and, and um, some of the things that are going to allow us to start having controlled immigration, that Australia is just got such a sterling reputation. There'll be more people wanting to come here. I, I actually had to go to the podiatrist the other day and she was from Hong Kong. And because of what, what's been happening in Hong Kong, they've relocated the whole family here. So uh, I think we will see again, immigration go uh, increase again as the vaccine takes place. And, we're, and we've got you know, systems to get people here that want to migrate. Those people will come with their money and they will also invest in the Australian property market. Um, Great, cities, I don't, let me just say one more thing here, David. It's just that our cities, you know, remain leaders in lifestyle. So besides the current uh, factors because of COVID and stimulus, there's just still a general trend to come to Australia. And I just want to answer this last point here, which a lot of people would be wondering about. Mm -hmm. What happens when these government incentives finish? And, you know, the, the government isn't going to keep doing you know, pumping money into the economy. We've borrowed from our future. So it's not free. Just look at Greece. They've lived on a lot of credit and they're paying for it now. Um, we, we've borrowed money and the government has put so much in there. You know, the amount of savings and, you know, credit card debt, savings is up, credit card debt is down. People got money to spend and they're doing that. And so now it's over to the private sector to pick up where the government's left off. The government says, we're just not going to keep funding it. Yeah, some people are going to get affected. And gonna we're going to have to deal with that. But what will happen is the private sector now will start taking over where the government is through growth and employment and you know, business confidence and, and individual confidence, which we're seeing. And so there will be a blip. And again, certain people will fall through those cracks because you just can't capture everybody. Mm. And the market will take control over there. And you know, some businesses will fail. Those that have been propped up by... Um, you know, the job keeper and their zombie business, they will collapse, but other businesses will rise in that. So will it be again as widespread? No, there's enough momentum, enough stimulus, enough cash there. And the government did its job. Um, it's not a perfect art and science, but it's sufficient enough to, to keep us going ahead. And so I would say to you that, that there is enough momentum in this market now across a number of industries that we're not going to see a massive drop off uh, there may be a slowing down, and I, and I think for the, for being sensible and what have you, we'd want to see that, but we won't see a a crash as people have been predicting. Yeah, that's great, Sam, and I think that's such you know really relevant points that you make there, and I think that that last piece around knowing that the journey we've been on in the last twelve months, and the fact is that the government have been fantastic in supporting our economy and it's, you know helping people through this period is to understand, you know, what happens when some of that starts to wind back. So I think that's a really, really important point, you know, which really then leads us on to... The results. <laughs> you still there, David? Hmm. 
Okay. Well, David, I don't know about to... that there sound. I just unfortunately, technology was not my best friend then, and it just dropped me on mute just as I was trying to lead him <laughs> okay. to this slide. And I apologize to everybody for flipping around then. Sure, many of you that have done a Zoom uh, over this past 12 months would appreciate what happened then and the you're on mute question. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll crack on. And Sam, here's a really interesting um, bit of data just to walk through here with some interesting numbers around the, the, the market. Yeah, the so, thanks. So, so again, we're, we're looking at, you know, what has the market done? And, you know, I'm always careful just to look at, you know, just even a quarter and annual, but this is just giving us a bit of an a, um, outcome of what's happened over the last 12 months. And we can see that every major city or capital city has, um, you know, increased in value as an annual change. Um, and uh, and even on, on the last quarter and, you know, Melbourne's there a little bit behind and, you know, and some of this data might even be, it's probably out of date already at January, 2021, because in the last 60 days, we've seen even more growth just in, in February alone than what the, 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 some of these cities had over a year. And, and I just sort of comment here that, you know, you might look at Darwin and, and, and even Hobart. And um, one of the things you go, wow, should I just rush out and look at those markets? And that's where, you know, even in our preparation, David, I mentioned to you that we need to widen our lens and not just look at even an annual and a quarter change. These are, you know, some indicators of what's happened. But what you, if, you, if you looked at Darwin over the last two or three years, it had actually been greater decline. And, you know, even with that 11.4% 11 11 increase, yeah. it's, um, it's uh, you wouldn't be above water again. You would have lost out of it where we're now beginning to see some of these markets uh, now hitting some of their record peaks whereas some aren't. And you also got to be aware that we're not looking for those spikes of growth. You know, you, you may get those spikes at the moment, but that's just not the market. You know, you, you have this big leap because of some artificial stimulus or, or measures that go in that, that create to prop up a market. But what you need to look at is uh, sustainable population and employment growth. Mm. Um, and, and that's where you need to just be careful by looking at these averages and making sure where you're going to go will we'll keep going forward. But what will be interesting is the next slide is where we look at the regional areas. So this here is a, a, a massive shift. And you look at the, the growth in regional areas um, that demand has increased significantly. And this is through the fundamental shift of uh, technology, work from home, mm -hmm. and, um, and the idea that people are looking for more space and lifestyle versus accessibility. And what do we mean by that? You know, uh, probably the probably the number one driver of uh, property investment that I'd heard over the last 25 years was, I need a place close to Sydney CBD. Everything was really referenced, you know, if, if there were people living in Sydney, that is, uh, if they were living in Melbourne, it's the Melbourne CBD. The idea was that, you know, proximity to the city was important because that's where you worked. And time is, is of high value in this millennium. And so people would, would consider, you know, how, how long it took to get to the CBD. And that would be a real determinant in, in buying property. However, time is of value, but it can be used in different ways now because of technology. And people want time with their family. And they look at the time they spend in traveling now. And if they don't need to travel and, and they can have better lifestyle and quality of lifestyle and that time with family, they might think, you know, I can live within an hour to two hours of, of Sydney CBD. If I need to come to work once a week or twice, uh, uh, you know, or, or once every fortnight. And that might take me one or two hours to get in there by a train or other form of transport. But I've saved another four days of travel where I might've, you know, spent about six to eight hours worth of travel per week because I had to go in every day. You, you begin to trade the accessibility for better quality of life and time in your personal sphere. And that's what's happened. And we've seen these regional house prices to, to lift dramatically. And the question again is, are all those regional markets the same? No. I mean, you look at regional WA, it isn't because there's so much land. It's regional New South Wales is different because th there are areas, again, that have got supply limitations and they're actually quite established. Then the question is, is this going to be in all of these regions a sustained uh, trend? And, you know, what I believe is it will be that in some areas and some area, other areas, not so much. Um, and so you've got you to be careful, again, of regional. There are regional and there, there are regional. And what we want to make sure of is where are those areas where you still got the skilled workers and they're not purely just lifestyle locations. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, what, what I'd always look for, David, is that you got to, again, have a wider lens. You, you got to think about the sustainable lifetime 
capacity of that area to grow. And the things that I would look for probably is three key sort of things or three and a half. One is jobs and population growth. That's really important. You know, I've, I've heard, you know, I've had some peers or colleagues or some people go and they've, they've you know, got a bit of extra cash rates or so low and they've bought some lifestyle areas. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Scarcity is important. So the, 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 the availability of land and the speed of what's that stock can come in is going to, again, create that, that demand dynamic where the value is going and the demographics, you know. Are there a lot of investors? And that's where we've seen a lot of apartment stock where there's, you know, high percentage investors or are the areas full of owner occupiers or is it, again, a very lifestyle property? And so, again, if you look at some of the, the regional areas that might not have as much industry, you're seeing people buy their second property there. And, and what I mean there is a second lifestyle property. The concern I have that is that when you do have an actual financial recession, which we haven't had here, as in a broad one, and I've, and I've lived through them in, uh, in the last 25 years, is you will find that people will let go of their secondary dwelling before their primary home. If they need to cash up, those markets are you know, affected, the economy is affected in some way. I don't know if you've been in those areas, David, and I've seen in some of those regions where you've got every third house is up for sale yeah. and it's difficult to get out. So you, you want to balance that euphoria that you've got out there, low cost of funds and everything, and that there are, there are some record numbers happening in those areas, but some of those properties will not necessarily continue to have that capital growth and they won't generally get that rental yield as well. So it is very much lifestyle driven. And it may be just a fad of emotion of, I just want to buy something in these areas for now. So you got to be careful about that. So you still need to have some fundamentals when you are doing your research and having a look. But the shift is that in some of these regions, they're going to have some momentum. And the great thing that we're going to see is there's also a cultural shift. People that take the culture with them the lifestyle they want, whether it be cafes, wine bars and what have you. And I think Australia is going to benefit dramatically and be a little bit more like Europe where we've had such a concentration in our three big cities on the East Coast where some of our regions haven't had the creativity and culture, but we, we're going to see those people go and we're going to have some more regions that will emerge and with new economies and new innovation and opportunities that develop on them. So Australia will be better off fundamentally and structurally because of this. And those regions will now have a momentum of their own. And we'll talk about some of them uh, in, in, um, coming up because not only have people moved there, but culture will go there. Mm. And, and that does have an impact on society and, and those, um, those areas, which will then create enough critical mass for them to keep attracting people there, where people will trade our mega cities to go to our next livable cities in that regard, where they can still get the value of, um, you know, growth and opportunity, but there is some better lifestyle that may be priced out of our major cities. Yeah, excellent, Sam. That's really sensible. And it's, it's, it's quite a, a, an interesting dynamic that's happening around the, the regional shift at the moment and, and really salient points. And, you know, this really leads into some of our core research for tonight. And that really is back to our premise that Australia is not just one market. We really can't stress this enough. And you know, for those of you that have, have, have joined us on these previous webinars or, or had the, the benefit of meeting with our team, and you've seen that this is a common theme, that we certainly, you know, we talk about the fact is that it's a location, but it's the suburb within the location and what are the factors behind it. So really pleased now to share a number of the key research areas. The first one we'd like to kick off with is it's one of our favourites. We say it's always on our investment radar hotspot, and that's the, the Hunter region. Yeah, that's right, uh, David. It's just been amazing. And if you even if you go back, 2017 is when Sydney hit its peak and Sydney began to correct and it began to drop. But guess what? The Hunter region actually kept going up. And we were, we were still encouraging people to go into that area. And so, again, not just because of COVID and what have you, fundamentally that region was growing. And it was growing uh, in a number of ways. Aerospace in the area there is actually quite big. There's, you've got the Williamtown Air Force Base. There's 5,000 aerospace jobs going to that region. Um, flights now, um, Qantas is flying directly from Melbourne. It is, um, if you go and look at some of the, the, the houses on the coast there in Newcastle, they're hitting four to five million plus. Mm. Uh, it's, it's the second largest city in New South Wales. The population is growing. It's great lifestyle. And we've just seen, again, the amount of people moving up there and living up there prior to COVID, but even accelerated through COVID. We manage a few hundred properties in that region and we have seen rents increase by 15%. That is, we've never had that pre-COVID, uh, but the rents are going up. The pe people are moving up there. They're loving the lifestyle, the opportunity. 
they will live and work in that region, but some of them will still may traverse back to uh, Sydney. And, and this may even include parts of the central coast and what have you. So there's a lot happening in that region. And we, we, you know, we're trying to get as much access to stock in that area, but land is sold out even up to 12 months at the moment in that area. But fundamentally, the, the, the critical mass is there and it was already there, but from food, lifestyle, entertainment, all of those things, we are seeing a, a, a very super, strong super region. If you look at the Hunter region and, um, and look at its population, you would sort of look at it as, you know, uh, you know, the size of a city like Munich in Germany or what have you. And its growth is, is you know, if you look at that economy, that's quite significant as an economy and could even match um, you know, some of our smaller capital cities. It, it's to me, it's much bigger than Darwin and even Hobart. So, and it's not a capital city. So thanks, David. We might go to the next region. So MacArthur on the, you know, this is the real growth corridor of Sydney, Sam. It's a, it's another exciting one to talk about tonight. Yeah. Um, you know, probably, oh, just around, just, just after the GFC, if you, if you go back a decade and um, uh, interest rates, interestingly, were, as Australia actually had high interest rates before we went into the, the global financial crisis, we were sitting at about eight and a half to nine percent. That seems so foreign now. And some of those that might be a bit older on the, um, the, uh, uh, the webinar here might remember back even in the, in the late 80s when interest rates were 17 to 20 percent. It's mm. just crazy. But if you think now a $2 million mortgage costs you as much as a 500,000 mortgage a decade ago in interest rate cost. So that 10 years isn't that long, but to, to now be able to afford four times as much. And that you can see why we're seeing some of these, this, this you know, rapid growth or this you know, demand coming into the market because we, we saw interest rates drop dramatically just even in the last 12 months. So what do I say that is that we talked about the Northwest of Sydney at that time, we talked about areas like Kellyville, Kellyville, and we got clients to invest there. And interesting at the time for people back then, that was sort of a little bit more of a merging area. And even people that was probably lived more in, you know, the, 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 the eastern suburbs and what have you, were a bit snobby and sort of said, who wants to live out at Kellyville? And I remember telling people to invest in Kellyville and people said to me, have you got anything closer to the city? And now we showed people stuff around MacArthur and the Wool and Billy Show. And you know what they say to me? Do you have anything in Kellyville? Um, and the thing is, you know, prices are well over a million dollars. And even like Box Hill that I talked about, there are houses going for $3 million in that area. There's no water view. It's, it's just infrastructure. There was a, you know, uh, the, the first part of Sydney's um, metro was built out that way, $8 billion invested. And the city just went out. And, and areas where there were this, you know, these markets that, you know, um, out in, in the Northwest, there was all land developed. There were big master plan communities and how you know land that used to get for two or three hundred thousand dollars. Well, good luck to you to get that for now under seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. So that region changed. And again, you don't need to be uh, someone like me that's been in the industry 25 years to figure it out. Anyone can tell you now that as, as you shift around Sydney, which is a basin, right? There, we've got the Blue Mountain, there's a there's a finite amount of land supply. Um, we now look at the southwest and everything from the airport there that's getting built down towards the Campbelltown and MacArthur region is a new metropolis that is emerging. And again, population growth, employment growth. And we're not just talking about you have to live right next to the airport. Who wants to live right next to the airport? You know, there's land that's becoming worthless because it's too close to the airport. It's all the cities that are getting built beside that airport and towards the Southwest. And so we see the Southwest and Wollandilly Shire again, we were, we've been pushing some people into there and, Again, people saying, it's just too far out. You know, I don't get it. And we work on a, on a formula that sort of says, get the land right, get the bill price right and get the return. And you will see people push out that way. And, and so that whole region there in Camden and Picton, if you sort of look at that towards similar to past, um, you know, Kellyville to areas like Riverston and what have you, where land now is under 300 square metres and with, you know, a small four bedroom home is up to a million dollars the land cost is about 15 to 1700 a square meter where we were, we were getting land here only up to a few months ago at around a 700 square meter rate it was the cheapest land in sydney in an o2 area code and this region has just gone nuts it's still opportunity there and we still see growth and it's still you know um, the cheapest land in sydney it's just getting some but as you see 10 billion dollars worth of infrastructure go to that airport then all the other things that will happen you will see what happened in the um, northwest begin to occur in the southwest of Sydney. 
And if you're looking for an investment over the next two to three decades to grow, here's where you would look because we're going to see a tectonic shift. And the airport that's getting built is not a just a utility. It's not a like a sort of big bus stop or, or, or plane stop. We're talking about beautiful design, lifestyle amenities and what have you. And the way they'll design this airport now, I mean, Sydney Airport's a pizza. It's been built over years. The first Sydney Airport, it's not a beautiful design or architectural piece. You know, there's bits everywhere. Here with what we know through good to, with town planning and placemaking, just like what Singapore has done, they, they've created in Singapore Airport, and I believe this, this Western Sydney Airport will create, is where you create it is both for uh, uh, tourists and travellers as well as the local community engaged. So the way they've designed the airport in Singapore is that the community can still go there and shop and engage with some amenities versus only be purely for um, commuters. And I think we'll see some of that come through and then also the adjacent cities and infrastructure that are getting built there. There'll be knowledge centres, there's, there's universities and hospitals and what have you built. You know, again, Australia does really well, uh, not just in property in general, but in, in, in designing precincts and, 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 and centres of excellence. And we, we understand how to create those really well. And we lead the world in a lot of that placemaking with our food and beverage industries. Um, and also thinking, okay, how do we create universities and, 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 um, and hospitals that sort of collaborate and work together? And so that design comes through even in the, in, the, in the planning design as opposed to just throwing things up randomly. Yeah, that's great, Sam. And I heard this week they'd made the announcement that it is uh, to be called the City of Bradfield. So that's a yeah. you know, arrow that they're branding. And, it and why, uh, if, for history's sake, who was Bradfield? David? Bradfield was the uh, major designer or city town planner of Sydney, original for Sydney, if I'm not mistaken. And did, and did the Harbour Bridge. Yes, correct. So, yeah, so hence this whole region yeah, will, will have such an iconic name. So let's go to our next region, David. So, so South, moving on from New yeah. South Wales up into to Queensland, like a lot of people, I guess that's the segue, really. Yeah, that is exactly what's happened. So, uh, so much prediction, so much hope for South East Queensland for so many years. And we are now finally seeing some of those predictions materialise. And, you know, it already, what we call South East Queensland is this triangle that includes the Sunshine Coast, um, Brisbane and the Gold Coast. If you begin to combine those areas, and they are beginning to combine with the corridors between them, you're actually creating a, a very large metropolis that's even bigger than Sydney in, in, as in the square metre uh, or square mile or square kilometre. Let's get the right metric system here. Um, but that's going to grow significantly. Um, what we're seeing is interstate migration is four times what it usually has been. People from Sydney, Melbourne going up there. Uh, the, the median house price is you know, a fraction of what we see here. And so, again, a flood of, of, of both locals going out to buy and um, you know, interstate migration happening. We're seeing that stock taken out of the market. We're seeing, again, new jobs and what have you going into that region. And, you know, lifestyle-wise, it ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of people. You know, there's a number of significant projects that are happening, both in infrastructure and rail and transport uh, that's happening in the state, as well as, uh, you know, entertainment and lifestyle. And even a number of businesses shifting there. The cost of business, do, doing business a bit cheaper in, in, uh, in Brisbane. And so we will see a continual shift there. You've got some, again, significant markets up there around Noosa. Um, your most expensive real estate is actually not in Brisbane. Uh, it's in Noosa in Queensland. Uh, it is a very unique market. Again, so limited in development, but lifestyle-wise, it's it's sort of like your French Riviera status where some of the the, the prices that people are uh, you know, paying for houses on that, those Eastern beaches and uh, in Noosa, uh, uh, you know, to the 10, to the 15, to the 20 mil plus range, which are, you know, your Sydney, Melbourne, uh, prices so a very unique market and um, you know if you, I don't know if it's changed but up until the end of last year early this year try to get a property for rental in um, in Noosa and surrounds you couldn't everything was taken and unfortunately people have been displaced in South uh, in some of those regions they're living in cars because rents have gone up two to three hundred dollars and they can't afford it um, so what we see happening in, 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 in southeast Queensland and the Gold Coast, all those areas, and again, I'd be very careful of some of those, like the Gold Coast has no height limit and can you know, shift boom to bust, where people buy apartments, they get caught up with the, the, you know, the, 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 the great views and the endless sort of beaches and that, never touch an apartment on the Gold Coast. I've, I've had clients that have that bought properties uh, you know, in, in, um, 
and apartments in those regions, even in, in, in Brisbane CBD, and they've just gone sideways for a decade or, 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 or so. So we see that now finally Queensland and house and land in certain areas is got the momentum behind it, the affordability, it will uh, have its turn now. And it's the first time really in probably about 13 years that it's actually had its shot. It, it, it was about to have its growth period uh, after Melbourne and Sydney a few years ago, but then the Royal Commission came in when it was Brisbane's turn. There were a few stop starts with some floods in the past and what have you, but now is the time to look at Brisbane and, and there, there's some good value still there. Uh, at the at, you know the price points that it can be still you know under the six hundred thousand dollar mark, but that won't last for another you know five years. That's great, Sam. Very interesting, and it is certainly a, a an area in, in high demand and, and set to to really boom. Um, there was another piece here that we we'd gone through in part of our from our research team. I thought was really worthwhile talking. You just touched on you know the the sideways movement of apartments and things like that, but this is a really telling graph. Um, keen to hear your thoughts about how you see this just in yeah. Brisbane itself. That's right. So this is here for Brisbane and um, Brisbane was one of those areas. I mean, this is again an indicator. I'm not certainly advocating that you'd go and, and look at an apartment in Brisbane, but actually for the first time in a while, uh, Brisbane units are renting for higher than Melbourne units. The overstock in Melbourne units is much higher, mm. but there was an oversupply of units in Brisbane CBD and um, that was you know creating a rental glut but because of the shift of people moving into state and um and you know people moving out and buying homes and what have you um there's a lot of people that have taken up rental in brisbane cbd and rents have actually started to increase and the, and the supply of stock has begun to reduce so yeah. what that's doing is a couple of things it's you know um supporting that that market there and, and creating a, a tightness in rents so rents are going up but it's also causing people thinking, you know what? I don't need to rent anymore because I can actually buy and it's a bit cheaper. And so it's pushing some people out of rental. So you've got new people coming to take rentals um, uh, that, you know, are in transition. And then you've got some people who are now shifting out of those rentals that will go and say, I, I can buy now because it's cheaper for me to buy than rent. And as we talked about that government stimulus, which was not only cheap money, it was some free money, particularly for people on the home builder where you got given instantly close to $50,000 between federal government grants and state government grants, instant equity to jump in, like one of the most glorious opportunities in, in a generation. And so it's pulled you know, a number of people out of rental and into their own homes. Uh, and you know, they've gone out there and, and you know, whether they've bought an apartment, a townhouse or a house, they've done that. And the government's given them you know, the deposit or most of it to get there, as well as really cheap rates to live in it, which is great. So I think it's a great outcome. So that's where COVID has been a blessing for some people and been the, one of the biggest opportunities. So moving back down to New South Wales and, you know, close to where we reside as, a, as an office is, the, is the, the Wollongong region. And it's been popular with us for a, a long time. And certainly it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a popular alternative to Sydney, Sam. The gong. Um, yep. So again, substantial population and really a satellite of Sydney, not that far out of Sydney, much closer than Newcastle, even the central coast to, you know, Sydney southern suburbs. And yes, we do have staff uh, that, that, you know, come in from there. Um, and it's it's quite close. You know, the highways accessible is good train. And I think we will start seeing now, um, and as I sort of divert a bit just from the Wollongong, we're going to start seeing there's enough critical mass now in Australia's population that there is um, some, some projects and some plans to create some more fast rail, which will begin to connect some of these other metropolises and, and cities. So even from um, Sydney down to Melbourne uh, via Wollongong, uh, sorry, via uh, Canberra, we're going to see some rail. And there's been talk about faster rail between Wollongong, so the major satellite city to Sydney, as well as Newcastle to Sydney. And, and there's now a business case for that, which then allows those um, next cities to grow substantially because if if there if there is a need to be connected to uh, Sydney's uh, major city for work and what have you and people still need to to travel in that rail makes a big difference and so mm -hmm. there's now a case where we've got enough population we've seen that happen really well in the UK and in, in Japan for a number of decades we're getting to the point where there is that there's enough density to do that but Wollongong has again those lifestyle qualities that Newcastle has as well as some Sydney's is it's coastal. Um, you know, people can live in the Sutherland Shire, for example, and pay a lot of money for a house 
without a view or go down the street a little bit and you now get some very different um, um, options with great views and lifestyle amenities. So that's why we've seen that. And the, the landscape there is probably even probably one of the harshest in the, in the country. It's very hard. And unfortunately, infrastructure by the local council and utilities can't keep up. And they've already, they're already way behind before COVID. They're struggling to bring some of that, um, that infrastructure in like sewer and water so land can be released into the areas and that. But we see the population growing considerably and you know, a number of different industries there. And if you look at, excuse me, Wollongong and Newcastle, they both had BHP there and BHP essentially has begun to wind down out of those areas. They were the best thing that happened in those places when they came. And one of the best things is as they begin to leave and relocate different locations or readapt some of their, their, um, their plants. So we see the growth in that area considerably uh, having a lot of momentum and sustained being so close to Sydney and also having their own critical mass of industry as well as lifestyle. And, and uh, having a sort of a, um, our own direct line of path up to the southwest of Sydney, to the MacArthur region and to, mm. to the airport. So people that, that might want to work in that whole uh, new metropolis in southwest of Sydney can live in Wollongong and access that region from by living in Wollongong or Wollongong surrounds. Thanks, David. It's really interesting. Heading down to the, to the nation's capital, Queen Bien, um, you know, beautiful part of the world, really. But um, sure. look, this is obviously a great area to, to, to deep dive into as well. Yeah, exactly. And so one of the areas we, were, we had was around Queen Bean or that region there. It actually sits on the New South Wales border, which allows us to develop certain products that we have. Um, and again, if you looked at some of the previous graphs and saw the median house price, um, Canberra is the third most expensive city in Australia behind uh, Melbourne and Sydney. And so what we will see over time, and there's a project called Clara, which is Consolidated Land and Rail Australia, and it's a, oh, I think it's a $200 billion project over the next 30 years to build a fast uh, speed train line from Sydney to Melbourne via Canberra and creating seven super cities uh, connected on that train line with the train traveling at, I don't know, four to 500 kilometers an hour, meaning you can get to, from Sydney CBD to Melbourne CBD in two hours, which is faster than the aircraft. Because if you think about traveling in an airplane, um, uh, from Sydney Airport, it's not in the CBD. You usually got to you know, catch another mode of transport to get there. Then you've got a bit of time to go through security, waiting to get onto the plane. Then you fly. Then you get, let's say get to Melbourne Airport. That's out nowhere near the city. And then you've got to get another taxi or Uber, hire car, whatever it is, train to get that. That trip is not a one-hour flight with all the other modes of transport to get there and the checks and safety. It's at least a three-hour to four-hour transition at times. Whereas if you can go from CBD, CBD via fast speed train in two hours and you're not affected by weather, you've got a very different proposition. So um, this, this project called Clara, and I'm sort of sort of diverting a little bit from Queen, uh, Queen Bean, but is that over time, what we will see is a connection of our major cities and there'll be cities in between that will lift in value. But we will connect eventually Canberra with Sydney and, and with Melbourne. The economy there is growing. There's a lot of lifestyle that's happening in the Canberra region as well, um, and hotels and what have you. It isn't as dowdy as it used to be. It was just a government town. There's enough culture and critical mass happening in that area. And one of the estates that we had in that region was Guggenheim, where the, the Prime Minister launched the Home Builder Program, you know, get off my lawn. And that was a Mervac master plan community, and it's just growing. And again, demand is crazy, values are strong, rental yields are strong. Um, and we, we see this again as, as, as a region. And it's not as greenfield as that picture looks like. That's somewhere nice with a wind farm. But uh, the area we're looking at is actually quite established. And, and you are closer to the Canberra CBD, but still getting the, the benefits of you know, a bit of space, a bit of land and some master plan communities. So we see that as a great opportunity. So it is really linked to the Canberra CBD, but falls in the New South Wales jurisdiction. Thanks, David. And, and just to be clear, Sam, that there won't be any form of wind farm in your backyard, as you quite alluded to, that it is much more of a, an <laughs> urban populated place. We'll head back up north now, Sam, up to probably this is, we talk about corridors and we talked about southwestern Sydney and, you know, feeding back up into Sydney in the basin. Well, the Tweed Coast has certainly been one that, that's been on our radar again in the the recent times because of its proximity into the booming southeast Queensland market. So this exactly. is another lifestyle area, Sam. Yeah, lifestyle, but still got um, connectivity to, um, mm. again, so it's not like a regional one where you might look at maybe 
uh, some Coffs Harbour and what have you, they're still a little bit further out. Here you're connected to the, to the Gold Coast or to Southeast Queensland, very close proximity, but you've got a very different dynamic. So I'm, I'm very, very bullish on this region. Um, again, so limited in land supply, not high rise, because as soon as you, you drop into the Tweed Coast into New South Wales, it's all low rise and very limited, uh, you know, high rise development. And if you go into areas around Kingscliff, Ballina, Byron Bay, again, you've got these crazy numbers. I mean, someone's trying to sell a house at Byron Bay, a new project, luxury home in the, in the main street of Byron Bay for 60 million. Now, there's no place if you just got the street to the Gold Coast or even to Brisbane CBD that, that will command those prices. But we've had even price sales of 25, 30 million in Byron. Why? It, it's got that. Um, gravitas and, and, and build. So, but even if you look at some of those regions, the median house price are well over a million on those, those northeastern New South Wales suburbs. And they've got a, a, a higher socioeconomic um, value and price and, 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 and design and the, and the quality of housing. So we feel anything around the Tweed Coast that we get. So again, very limited. We, we know one developer that's been working on a project for a decade and you know there's a fairly large estate that will be released probably we've been getting told for so many years we've been waiting for it but he's got 10,000 lots of land again it sounds like wow a massive rush of land but that will not come on in one hit and it's already take we've been waiting for it for 10 years we, we were ready 10 years ago for it but the value that's gone up is you know he's made a few extra billion being delayed he's been delayed by the local council so at first he's upset but now I think he's absolutely thrilled uh, but when that comes to market, um, that will be a great opportunity. Again, our challenge is getting um, stock in that region because there's limited supply, but there's you know, great population growth, great lifestyle, and, 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 and close proximity to the uh, hospitals and universities and CBD that's happening in the Gold Coast, which we're seeing again a great shift because a lot of talent and people are moving up from Sydney and Melbourne into the Gold Coast. So again, becoming a metropolis that is not purely a um, holiday destination, but there's other forms of commerce developing and growing in those regions. And health is actually one of the biggest uh, industries in Queensland or in Southeast Queensland, both in Brisbane, the Sunshine Coast and in the Gold Coast. Queensland is going all out as health. You know, they're, they're not necessarily uh, tech they're interested in, but they're, they're, the belief there is that we can invest in health and, you know, biotechnologies and what have you there's good economies in that. And that's what we're seeing as, as one of the great industries in Southeast Queensland. Thanks, that's Dave. That's great, Sam. Thank you very much. And I think that's sort of rounding off some of the six key regions and what we wanted to do now, and we are conscious of time tonight um, because we have covered a lot of ground, but we just wanted to really launch into now to a couple of really good case studies. Again, we love a quote. Kathy Fetke came up with this great one. Real estate's like the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's something that pays you month after month, whether you are working or not. And that's a really you know, sound piece that, that kicks us off into a couple of really great case studies here, what we're actually doing for our clients today, Sam. This one's over at Thermia. That's right. Well, the case studies are what we did with them probably 12 months ago. Uh, <laughs> and, and now they've come to fruition. And probably, again, that quote, again, it really depends on what kind of product that you get. And so, again, it's not, we, we, we are focused both on capital, sorry, capital growth as well as good income. And here's some products we showed some of our clients that bought just around, when COVID had, had started and, you know, nine, 10 months later, uh, 12 months later, they, they finished. And, you know, this package was 728,000 down at Thirlme in that Picton area that we talked about that, that a lot of people said, it's just too far out. Uh, those packages are now hitting close to $800,000 because the land has just gone up and literally just even over the last two or three months has, has just escalated dramatically. The rent on this property was uh, has been achieved. It's been leased out. One, uh, the four better for, uh, 490 a week and the two better for 390 a week, which is 880 combined. So the yield achieved on the purchase price is 6.3%, which is a great gro gross rental yield. The property at a 100% lend on a 3.3% interest rate is generating a $15,000 a year positive cash flow after tax, which is just incredible. So a pre tax return will be closer to 25,000 uh, plus, depending on your tax rate. And the projected capital growth is 8% per annum. Well, we've seen more than that in the first 12 months. Thanks, David. Yeah, that's really impressive, Sam. And the next one's over in uh, Thornton, which has been another great suburb for many of our clients. Yeah, so again, you know, we're seeing people still trying to find and, and, and scrape up stuff there, but being ahead of the curve there allowed some of our clients to jump into a two, four-bedroom duplex for about um, 807000 
that's uh, completed now with a market appraisal of a million and thirty. So you know, a good two hundred thousand dollar uplift or a twenty five percent increase on the initial purchase price. The combined rent is nine seventy a week, uh, which is a six point two percent rental yield and positively geared about nineteen thousand dollars a year. Mm. Thanks, David. And this next one, Sam, was just a more recent one of a property that we've got that was just purchased late last year and is still being constructed, but it's been a really good story in terms of that manufactured equity. If you just want to step people through that logic. Yeah, so again, maybe similar to the previous one is where you know we've got our dual incomes and they're just a little bit cheaper to build than that. They're usually a four plus two or a three plus two or a four plus one. But here, this is where you've got a separately titled property. There, are, there you are being a developer. So there's a little bit more risk uh, and a little bit more cost and banks tend to not lend as much because they treat it as a development. Mm-hmm. But you, you building, you know, taking a block of land, building two dwellings and subdividing it with separate title. So you can sell the, the properties off on completion. Uh, there are some things to note that, you know, some people think I'll just build it and sell it and, and you know, straight away. Uh, you need to be aware if you do that, it'll be treated as a development. You have to pay GST. Okay. Uh, so unless you wait probably around about five years and keep it as an investment. So don't just think you're going to build it, flip it and sell it. You'll be exposed to a little bit more tax. Uh, but here you can see it's again, you know, the, the, the cost for building the two, you know, as a package is around about 835 or about $417,000 each. On completion, the dwellings are, you know, estimated value around about 490, probably a little bit more now with the way the market's going, but you've made an, an uplift, you've manufactured equity. So you're not just waiting on the, if you look at the bottom uh, left hand there, the 6% normal capital growth for a standard investment where the land values appreciate purely by manufacturing products like two separate products and separate titles, you create that equity. Again, these are even more scarce. They're harder to find because the box land will be bigger and there's a limit to how many of these can be done. Plus you generally need about a 30% deposit, uh, but you can generate a, a good yield uh, both rental as well as some capital growth that you bring forward through the subdivision. And I think we're just getting close to the end now, David. And people we are, been, Sam. We I'm are. A bit, bit long-winded tonight. Yeah, so. we've, 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 covered, we've covered a fair bit of ground. And I think this is a really good moment here, just as we, we do close out tonight, Sam, to talk a little bit about, you know, there's some of the case studies of how we've worked with our customers. But if you just want to share, you know, the headlines of how we work day to day, really encourage people to, to think about, you know, their investing strategy. Yeah, so look, um, you know, if you haven't uh, engaged with our company, one of the things we try to get people to focus isn't just on property, it's very much to develop a personalized strategy. And we provide that at no cost. It's fairly comprehensive and it gives you an idea to look at, you know, how you can build a portfolio over time versus just the current hype in the market. Uh, and then we can help you, you know, from there, get your the right finance structures that you need to have because everyone can have, you know, Different finance structures is really important. You know, some people might even redraw the cash out of their home loan to invest in a property. It's not the smartest thing to do because there are tax consequences for doing that. You should pay it off your loan and pull the money out of a, an investment split. Why would you do that? They're the things we can canvas when we speak with you. Um, and we can help you manage the builds all the way through to the properties being tenanted and, and, and you know, with rental guarantees. So it's really important. One of the biggest things is access to land. And, uh, you know, I'd even say thanks to some of our clients who even work with us and they're on. They keep showing us where there's land. And that's, that's our challenge at the moment. We are knocking down every door, um, you know, trying to find land for our clients. And so one of the things, you know, we've been through these cycles before. We've hit a fever pitch at the moment where, again, the, the home builder program has brought a lot of demand forward. Uh, developers and councils and what have you are trying to again release more land or get land to market we will see that come on uh, and so at the moment one of the things we do is we get people prepared and ready and then also get people onto waiting lists for the next releases and but we do want people to be careful and be you know also patient not to rush out and just buy anything uh, and just look for some of those opportunities but we do you know uh, invite you if you haven't uh, ever got a, a property investment plan or you're you know, looking for your next property or what have you, engage with our team and we would get you ready for some of the opportunities. And we would apply a lot of the things that, um, that you, know, you, you see here from a general point of view that contextualize it for you. But thanks once again for everyone listening. I hope there's a lot of value there. So I always start off thinking, I'm going to have enough to say. I end up having too much to say, but hopefully it's both uh, educational, interesting and, um, and beneficial for you. Thanks, David. Thanks, thanks, Sam. And look, you know, I think 
we, we, we have covered some ground and, and as we always talk about that we say to ourselves, we'll keep this to 35, 40 minutes and we always tend to go over because there is so much to talk about with it. It's such an interesting topic and we know a number of people have left questions for us tonight. For those people that have left questions, we do apologise. We will go back and answer to you directly on those questions and, and look to work with you. But as Sam said, the main thing is now to think about getting a strategy understand that there is a scarcity of land and things like that but it's about making informed choices and the place to start is to really get in contact with our team very very simple way you can do that is just simply drop us an email at hello at dpn.com.au um, it's a great email address to have hello at dpn.com.au and our team be really welcome to have the opportunity to have a chat to you about where you are today and how we might be able to help you with that in mind, Sam, I'll say good night and we'll say thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. We look forward to talking to you in the future and uh, wish you all the best with your property investment journey. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.